America's uh, mainstream media is overwhelmingly white. My next guest says in her book that white progressives or white liberals, they are causing a serious problem in media. Mm, Y'all going to enjoy this conversation with Bacha Ungar Sargon, the author of the book, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. It got a little spicy between the both of us. All right, Bhatti, let's talk about your book, uh, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. First off, define your definition of woke. Great. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be talking to you and very excited for this conversation. Woke to me means it doesn't mean police reform. It doesn't mean ending mass incarceration. It doesn't mean ending the racism in our public schools. And it doesn't mean ending intergenerational poverty among 20 to 30 percent of Americans descended from slaves. That is all things every American should be focused on. Those are really important things. Those are national emergencies. Woke is what I found out about in a 2018 Yale study that found that white liberals talk to black and Hispanic Americans different than they talk to other whites and different than white conservatives talk to black and Hispanic Americans. White liberals dumb down their vocabulary when they talk to blacks and Hispanics. This was a Yale study from 2018 that found that. That is wokeness. It's a view that says that white people have a power and a privilege and an agency that puts them above people of color so that their instinct unconsciously when they meet a person of color is to dumb down their vocabulary. And I think that that is so, so corrosive and patronizing. The assumption of oppression based on skin color, it is really dehumanizing. That's what wokeness is but the, I but I think that's part of the problem uh, because the reality is what you initially said is how how wokeness or being woke was defined uh, African Americans actually define that uh, in terms of what woke is now what then happened was I think get a number of different things how other people non-black folks then began uh, to define wokeness also uh, how uh, those who don't agree with those issues begin to define it. I think about, uh, again, political correctness. I think about diversity. I think about how those phrases have been turned on their head. So I think part of this issue uh, is when we talk about woke, black folks have a very clear understanding of woke is, is when non-black folks then begin to try to define it for us as opposed to sticking with what the actual definition is. I could not agree with you more. I think that's a really crucial point. And I think that every single place where progressives lose their way is when they depart from where the black community is at. Every but it's not issue- just progressives though. It's not just progressives because part of the uh-huh. debate issue that I've had here, even with this, is with is even with conservatives, with white conservatives, uh, or hell, even some black conservatives. Because again, the, the use of woke then begins to be used as a negative, yeah. uh, just like uh, diversity. Uh, then all of a sudden, it then it then e- evolved into, oh, we need diversity of thought, and then diversity region of country. That was all an attempt to actually water down uh, what the point of diversity is. And I think where we are now, how woke is being used, it is being used now as an attack against black folks and others, as opposed to folks saying, what is it really about? I use it exclusively to attack white liberals. So, but but your charge is accurate. The word woke started as black slang for all the things I listed as the important things, right? And now conservatives and people like me who are on the left, who are angry at where the progressives are at, use it as a pejorative. And that is a totally fair charge. That that is a problem. We appropriated a word from the black community that was describing something important to describe something bad. But when I talk about it, I am almost only speaking about white progressives and the ways in which they've departed from the black agenda and the way they use intersectionality, the way they use gay rights, the way they use immigration to over and over abandon the black community, abandon Americans descended from slaves in order to push their own economic agenda under the guise of social justice. That's my problem. Well, and and, and, and the problem that I have is that it is how whether they are progressive whites, whether they are conservative whites, how it is used. And then what ends up happening is uh, black folks are the ones who actually get screwed. In the outset of your book, you talk about 
uh, how media uh, did not, uh, in terms of uh, beginning of media, did not uh, really care about uh, working class uh, people. Um, and as I was reading it, what I was actually looking for was for you to actually be even more granular and say white media. Uh, because when you talked about Joseph Pulitzer, when you talked about uh, the first newspaper uh, in uh, the penny papers uh, in New York, while I was reading it, I'm sitting here going, yeah, but there was a paper called Freedom's Journal, the first black newspaper uh, founded on March 16th, 1827. I think about uh, Frederick Douglass, the North Star. I think about Ida B. Wells, Barnett, a paper in Memphis. Black, black media was talking about working class issues. And so uh, I think part of the part of the thing, though, is being very specific we have to say white media. So I, I talk a little bit about Frederick Douglass's The North Star in the context of the fact that, you know, people don't know this, but um, um, Lloyd Garrison, who was a white abolitionist, actually canceled Frederick Douglass, a former enslaved person, because he felt that he was compromising, right? This that, that is exactly what I'm describing. You're totally right. There was a rich tradition of black media. I talk a little bit about it in the book, but not enough. But what was so interesting to me was to see how this white progressive abolitionist felt that it was his job to cancel a slave. He canceled his newspaper. He told people not to buy it. He stopped paying for him to travel to speak about his experiences as an enslaved person because Frederick Douglass came to the opinion that the Constitution actually did enshrine the rights of all people, irrespective of race, and that it was only through the legal system and only through the Constitution that civil rights for all was ever going to be possible, which was, of course, Dr. what Dr. King picked up on. And for this guy, Lloyd Garrison, no way, no way only revolution, right? No way to work within the system. And so this white person appointed him the savior of the slaves and then canceled Frederick Douglass. But that is, but when we look at American history, though, I mean, the reality is, uh, you know, this year, Liberia celebrates uh, the 200th anniversary uh, of uh, its creation. Uh, and then you have the American Colonization Society, which is comprised of uh, a diverse group. Uh, in, you had those people who actually believed, who were abolitionists, who didn't believe in slavery. But then, of course, you had uh, those white plantation owners who were afraid that uh, freed people of African descent were somehow going to free their slaves. And so you had these two forces, multiple forces that were involved in the American Colonization Society. I think part of the thing that and one of the reasons why I was making that distinction um, uh, about Again, white media uh, is because uh, the operative the operative word, whether you're talking about white progressives or white conservatives, is white, and that is the issue in this country. Even at, 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 in, at, at you know the, the inside of your book, when you say something is wrong with American journalism, I will then I will actually change it to say something is wrong with mm. uh, American white journalism mm. because th th these are the issues we're dealing with because in 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 when we say mainstream media, we really mean white media. Yeah, the yeah. issue that you find is they look like Wall Street, look like yeah. Silicon Valley. Yeah. And so you do not have uh, uh, real voices at the table. You're now seeing it. Kim Godwin, president of ABC News, Rashida Jones, president of MSNBC. But when you got a majority of your newspapers in the country who won't even fill out the ASNE diversity survey, that tells you where we are in white media. Yeah, yes, 100%. I, I would argue, though, that the reason that American media is so is so white is because it is made up of people of immense economic privilege. And unfortunately, America's rich are still America's white. So to me, the class piece here is a much bigger problem because when you look at the people of color who are allowed to succeed in American media, they are all from Harvard or Princeton or Yale or University of Chicago. Their backgrounds, their economic and educational backgrounds look a lot like the other American elites, whereas you look at the black community and two thirds of black Americans say that they are either moderate or conservative. You're never going to hear those voices in the liberal mainstream media. But, but this is again, uh, I, I, I get your point. But the problem, I think, is it, it's too narrow. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is you're only really talking about New York, D.C., large cities. The reality is, uh, it, it, so look, I've been covering mega churches, and people have this assumption that, uh, oh my God, there's a problem with 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 with, with Christianity. Is these mega churches? Well, mega churches only comprise four percent of all churches in the country. Ninety six percent of the churches in America are not mega churches. When we talk about uh, elite, look, 
the average journalism salary ain't several million dollars or even a hundred thousand uh, dollars. My first job coming out of college, the Austin American Statesman, which had about 230,000 circulation, uh, offered me $20,100. I said, no, you gotta pay me at least two grand more. Uh, when I got hired at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram uh, a year later, it was at $32,000. Uh, and so the issue, I think, again, I think we gotta, we gotta define this. The issue is when you talk about large, large media companies that did then become sort of the gatekeepers. But the journalists out there who are doing some amazing work, who are covering some amazing issues, they're not part of the elite. They didn't go to the Harvard's University of Chicago. That's really your New York Times, your Wall Street Journal, your papers like that. And of course, Fox News, ABC, NBC, where you got people who are in the air talking about so-called working class voters, but they're making several million dollars and their kids going to private school. So it's a really important point. Let me just clarify a little bit. Um, so 75% of American journalism jobs today are on the coasts. The majority of journalists working today are actually working for either digital media companies, national media companies, or those elite legacy media companies. Local journalism is unfortunately dying. It's very sad to say. You're totally right. There are still local journalists who are working for $40,000 a year. But the vast majority of journalists are coming to a place like New York and taking a starting salary of $25,000 a year to work in a digital media company, which tells you everything you need to know about who their parents are, right? Because you could not have afforded to live in New York City on $25,000 a year when you but, were starting. But, but, uh, but this is where, I, this is again, this is where I got to push back because I know individuals who are not coming from rich backgrounds. And so uh, they're not. What you have is, uh, look, I, I'm dealing with people. Uh, look, I'm a three-time board member of the National Association of Black Journalists, mm -hmm. lifetime member in the Hall of Fame. And we're, I'm, I'm dealing with journalists who are, who, are, who, are, who are looking at jobs in Chicago, looking at jobs in New York, places like that. But they're not making a lot of money. Two and three or four of them are living, uh, living in apartments uh, with others. And so it's, it's not, I mean, I, I get your point, but... I know a whole lot of folk who look like me who don't come from rich backgrounds. They are not. I, I totally believe you. There are people who manage to do this. There are people who do this. But I'm just telling you from like a from a purely data point of view, they are the exception rather than the rule. And by the time they're in their 40s and 50s, they'll be making over one hundred thousand dollars a year, which puts them in the top 10 percent of Americans. Yeah, but if you but if you're looking at someone who is so the average is brought down because younger journalists do make less money. But if you stay in this in this industry, if you make it in this industry, you're going to be part of the elites by the time you're in your 40s. You're going to be well. Well, well, even, it, well, first of all, even on that particular point, there we talk about uh, the elites, which I think is a phrase, frankly, as being thrown around left and right. I mean, I, it, it trips me out when I see politicians uh, talk about the elite when, if you look at the salary of a member of Congress, that so-called puts them in the elite. Totally. Uh, so, so, so part, so part of this issue is that when we start breaking down really, uh, uh, you know, money in America, what the average median family income is, what the average salary is. And so, uh, the average American is not making a hundred thousand dollars. And so, uh, I, I think that again, how, how, how uh, you know, the word elite is being used, um, uh, is is being used, I think, uh, in, in a different way in, in terms of we look at salaries. We look, I mean, I hear people say college professors, they are the elite. Well, I know some people who are adjunct professors who are making 10, 12, 15,000 or making 40 or 40, 40 or 48,000 dollars. And so this, I think, still speaks to what goes from, from a media standpoint in terms of what are the interests that matter? And I think one of the things that happens in media, and I've dealt with this at KRLD Radio in Dallas. I've dealt with this uh, in, in, in daily newspapers. Luckily, I've gone to the black media side. This whole focus on, hey, we're going to target our news to high wealth areas because we're looking at advertising. And that plays a role in the type of coverage that we're also seeing. Yeah, but I think we're agreeing. Like, I think we, I think you and I both totally agree that the media does not reflect the views of like the average American, you know, the average black American. They just do not see their views or their interests or the things that they need reflected in the media. Don't you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. But see, yeah. again, though, but see, but the position that I take is I don't believe this is based upon wokeness. I think it's based upon whiteness. 
And when I say whiteness, uh-huh. I, 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 I'm, I'm talking about the reality of where this country is. The reality is that when you talk about, again, and how you laid out in this book here, uh, going back, all of those newspapers going back to 1906, 1907, going through the 30s and 40s, they supported Jim Crow. They locked black journalists out of the newsrooms. They were white only. Uh, and so and then you didn't you didn't see your first wave of black journalists in the media until the Kerner Commission report came out in 1968, declaring there were two Americas, one white, one black. And then, of course, and they say part of the problem with the riots is you didn't have black people who were in these newsrooms. And so your first wave of black journalists really came in in the late 60s, the early 70s. And so right now we're really only operating on the second generation of black uh, and brown journalists in newsrooms. And so, again, I don't for me, the issue is not how woke media is undermining democracy is how white media <laughs> Is and I'm just, I mean, and that's just as somebody who's worked in daily newsrooms, and I have had to confront white journalists who simply uh, don't. I, I, I'll just give you just a just a perfect example. I covered Khalid Muhammad came to speak in Fort Worth, mm-hmm. and he had gotten suspended by a Louis Farrakhan as national spokesman for the Nation of Islam, and so I went to cover the speech, and I came back with my story. And I get called into my office, to the office by Debbie Price, who was the executive editor of the Fort Worth Star Telegram, who should have never been hired. In fact, she had never been an editor in her entire career, even going back to college. But she got the job over an African-American man who had been a city editor, state editor, assistant managing editor. But the publisher liked her. But that's another story. And so she asked me, what the hell is this? And I said, like, what do you mean? She's like, well, your story looks totally different than the story that's in Dallas Morning News. Uh, and I said, well, you need to call Dallas Morning News, figure out what the hell they were doing. Because, <laughs> because, because in that story, here's what happened. Mm-hmm. The white journalist, uh, who, I think his name Todd Gilliam, who wrote it, he talked about, oh, how folks had to be searched before. Well, anybody's covered the Nation of Islam speech. Hell, I'm used to that. Hell, I, you, I go through, a, uh, 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 I get searched, I got searched yesterday at the White House. Okay. And so he, how he framed the story was uh, Khalid Muhammad said, pin the tail on the donkey, on the honky, not the donkey. Okay, anybody been to the ancient Islamic speech, you know, typical things freight. But I focused on what Khalid said. Mm-hmm. So you had two different stories, mm-hmm. written by black journalists, written by white journalists, mm-hmm. the exact same speech. So the white editor is questioning me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, go talk to the white guy. If you read what I wrote, I wrote what he talked about, not the uh, not the other things that will push someone's button. Mm-hmm. And that's a perfect example. That's why I'm saying I think the issue, it ain't wokeness. It's whiteness. It's how we see the world that now then is portrayed in how we cover the news. Well, to me, that story is like a perfect story of like like the, the su- complete and utter success of like you because you were able to get your opinion out there and published in the paper. No, it wasn't opinion. No, it wasn't opinion. No, no, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry. It was sorry. a news right. yeah, yeah. You story. were able to get that crucial reporting out there to all of your readers. And the fact that your editor, after the fact, had a problem with it, like that only makes it even more delicious that you were able to do that through your good reporting. And but the problem is this here. The problem is this here. I was the only black male reporter in the entire. It's newsroom. very it's a huge problem that America's newsrooms remain overwhelmingly white. But the reason they are so white is not because the people hiring in them are racists. They would kill to have more black reporters as a person who works in a newsroom. I would kill no, to wouldn't. have more black people writing with me, working with me. It That's not the problem. It's not because they don't want to hire black people. It's because the only people applying for these jobs come from privileged backgrounds, which no, are overwhelmingly no, white. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're wrong. I literally, I, I literally, listen, I was a, I was a, na- I mean, you're, you're absolutely wrong. I was a national student representative on the board of the National Association of Black Journalists. Mm-hmm. And we sat in a room with the top headhunters. They were the ones who the TV stations would hire to go hire anchors and producers. And we sat there in Los Angeles. This is March of 1990. And they're going, we would love to hire more black producers and we just can't find them. And literally sitting on our board were five black producers. One of them Oscar nominated. And this is what she said. How many do you want? Which market sizes and level of experience? She said, I can call 100 right now. 
So what happens is what you're saying is that that it really is a it is a white media excuse because it goes to where they recruiting. We just saw this in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley's talking about oh, we can't find black engineers. But you know where they were they were not going? They weren't going to Spelman. They weren't going to Xavier. They weren't going to FAMU. Wait, they weren't going to Prairie View. Hold on. So that's did the they struggle. did they then not hire the people she suggested or they did no. hire them? No. Because it because it then becomes the next excuse. See, uh, this is I, again three times I've been a board member. I've sat in in meetings where we have met with CNN. We met with Penske Media. We have met with um, uh, Verizon when they owned uh, uh, when they owned uh, Oath. I mean, I have sat in meetings with local stations, local newspapers, sitting across from white media executives who mm -hmm. say, "Oh, we would love to hire," but then all of a sudden, what then happens is it then becomes where I, where whiteness comes in. Do I know this person? Where they come from? Uh, I'm not quite so sure. And then all of a sudden, then you have black journalists. Who are who are in on islands, and then when it comes to trying to get those stories, if they do get hired, they try to get their stories into uh, the, the uh, to the to the papers or onto the websites or on the air. Then it becomes, mm, you know, I'm not quite sure. CNN, see, when I was at CNN, they could not find somebody to go interview Winnie Mandela. Okay, great. They said, Roland, will you go? Sure. I go down to Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. I interview Winnie Mandela. They come back and say, uh, do the interview, about 20 minutes with her. They go, we got a problem. I'm like, what's the problem? Why didn't you ask her when she went on trial uh, uh, for the accusations of them putting tires around the necks of people? I said, why the, I said, why the fuck y'all didn't interview her? I said, I asked Winnie Mandela what I want to ask Winnie Mandela. Mm -hmm. They literally said, we're not going to run the interview. That's terrible. I went, so, no, no, no. It's fine. I went to John Klein, the president of CNN, and said, hey, they're not running the interview. Give me the tape. I'm going to run it on my TV One show because I had a weekly show on TV One, Black Cable Network. Again, Black-owned media. John mm -hmm. said, great. Winnie Mandela dies in March of 2018. Mm -hmm. I was in, it was in, in, in uh, Memphis covering the 50th anniversary, getting ready for the 50th anniversary of the assassination of MLK. I hear she dies. We restreamed the interview. The only reason you can see that interview is because I had a Black-owned media outlet. But these were white editors deciding, oh, we don't like the fact that you didn't ask her this question. Y'all even send me questions. So therefore, we're not going to run it. And this is what I'm talking about. This is the frustration for black and minority journalists. And so, again, I, I read your book and I went through it. And literally, every time where you put woke, I put white. And, and, and that is the, <laughs> and that, that, so, the, so, the, so the problem is that when we talk about what was happening is they are they are seeing America through their blue eyes or green eyes and not understanding that how you view America is different if you're black or Latino or Asian. And that's why American me white media is the way it is now. So for me, it ain't wokeness. It really is the problem of whiteness and how they define what to be an American is. Um. I, I mean, I think I, I think there's a lot less um, daylight between our positions than uh, you're making it sound, <laughs> because I would say I'm sure that there are problems with, let's say, conservative white media as well in capturing certain aspects of the black experience or the l Hispanic experience. But the problems don't stem from the woke worldview. They stem from something else. So to me, wokeness is like white liberal specifically. But I totally it, agree with you that there are probably the problems. They come on the, from the, the same right pool. They come from the same pool. I mean, again, that's what I'm saying. I look because I've I've been there. I've I've sat across from what I who I believe are so-called white liberal journalists. But okay, okay. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Okay, when you're sitting opposite white liberals versus white conservatives, that study that I started with, right? That sort of patronizing thing that white liberals do when they're talking to black people and Hispanic people. Yep. Like, doesn't that feel different than when you're talking to white conservatives? Don't you? Isn't nope. it a different thing? No. Nope. Because this, because because the, the sociologists found that white conservatives don't do that. I'm not saying they don't have problems. They do have their own problems. But that that patronizing thing where they look down on you from this position of like, you know, I have so much privilege. Yep. I have to protect you. Conservatives don't do that. Mm, they do. But again, it's a different it's it, 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 it's how it comes out. Here, here's the deal. If, if, if someone ignores me 
and then someone is patronizing me, frankly, I'm feeling the same damn way. And and again, I'm somebody I, I've actually been in that position. Right. Uh, and, and so I, I respect that experience. But I would say the you, you fix the, those two problems may emotionally impact you differently. The same, but you fix them differently. You can't use the same thing to fix them. They need yes, different. I, I, actually, I can. Actually, actually, I can. The, in order in, to deal with the issue that you're talking about. OK, what you're laying out in terms of class and coverage I'm telling you right now, the difference is Mm -hmm. you cannot have a you cannot have American media, American white media, where literally 80 plus percent of those who are in charge are white men. I totally agree with you. And so and and, and so that then now drives the narrative. It drives the coverage. It drives the decision making. And so then when you talk about the what what then what then comes out of that is, oh, now, how do we now cover this? So now if I'm a white male conservative, I may I may look at this differently from that so-called white ally. The problem for me as a black man, the outcome is the same. And that's my problem. So how I, you arrive I, at it, I don't I really totally care. I totally agree with the you. Outcome. I totally agree with you. I, I, I nowhere would I ever dispute that it's not a problem that America's newsrooms are so white. It is a total and utter failure. I completely, completely agree with you. I just think that the the reason for that is not racism anymore in 2022. I mean, see, it, it but, may have been in the 90s, but it's not anymore. It's but, something but, but, else. But, but, but see, but see, right? Okay, so let's 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 unpack that. And the reason okay. I, I think it's important important to unpack that because you say it's not racism because this is the problem that we have when we have this conversation. We go racist, not racist, and then that becomes the debate. The problem is not racist, not racist, because. There ain't that many people you've actually met and I've met who will say, damn it, I'm racist. They're not going to say it. The problem is not that. The problem is all of this in between. And that is actually the conversation we should be having because it's what you said in terms of what's patronizing, um, what's paternalistic, what's paternalistic. Uh, It's also um, it's also. Uh, whether you're looking down on someone or ignoring someone, it's the perceptions. Uh, it's it's all of those different things. I remember it's interesting. Um, if, if you look at um, uh, Ken Delaney is a national security reporter for NBC News. Mm-hmm. Ken and I worked together the Fort Worth Star Telegram. I was a city hall report, one of two city hall reporters. He was one of two county government reporters, and it was quite interesting how the white ex- editors would. Oh, how Ken was aggressive and he was assertive uh, and he was, I mean, all these different things. Now, that was a period where Ken was making a lot of mistakes. We had to run corrections in the paper. But the language they used towards me was totally different. It was arrogant, cocky, wearing your ambition on your sleeve. Now, we literally sat right across from each other. And it was very interesting just watching how the same editors looked at two reporters of the same age who were both covering political beats and how their language towards both of us was totally different. So the point I'm making is not racist, not racist. It's the stuff that's in between that then begins to drive what you talk about in the book that also to dr- to drive decision making, hiring, promotions and advancement. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, to me, the stuff in between um, is not as important as the actual racism that still exists. That's no, very real. No. <laughs> but y'all, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is, this is, a, this is where I'm sorry. Well, you're wrong because here's, here's why I think you're wrong on this because again, Here's what America sees as racism. America sees somebody calling you the N word. America sees someone with a burning across in your front yard. Uh, th- that's how, we, oh, that's racism. They don't see it as racism by going, hmm, what, what school they came from? Texas Southern University? 
That's that's a that's a HBCU. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I'm a, I'm gonna take this Texas A and M person. They're never gonna say that's racist. That is actually literally racist. No, 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 no. But yes, it is. Say, no, no, no. But, follow me. I know. I know what you're saying. But they're not gonna say it's racist. No, See, that's that, to me the same as saying the N word. It's saying I don't want to work but, with someone who's black. But that's no, 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 literally no, literally no, no, racism. But, right, right. But 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 here's the deal. <laughs> they might even they might even prefer this black person who's from Texas A and M and not Texas Southern. See again. I, but that's I, classism. I, I mean, that's that's. <laughs> well, no, because because here's the deal. There are acceptable blacks. Look, I, look, so that O'Brien told the story when so that really liked me on her show. And that was a black executive who told her Roland's the Roland's not the right kind of black. That's classism. That's not racism. Because it's not about race. It's about behavior. It's about something you can control. No, no, no. It's, it's about, you know what? These are the kind of blacks we like. But that's not, that's can't be about race because they're, that's about behavior. That's about class. That's about a, an attitude. That's about, you know. No, no, no. But, it, but see, you uh, said it's about class, but here's the deal. We might come from the same social economic background. The difference is that's a that's a more palatable you know what oh he's not as militant he's not as he's okay he he see what, what, what begins to happen what begins to but the, the problem where it still is race is because who is the person in the position deciding those things the struggle that i have and again as i was going through your book and again as i was looking at the examples you used when you were talking about again coverage uh, in the issues, even when we talk about just this notion of working class, when you I mean, when that phrase is used, I'll be honest with you, they ain't talking black people. I talking am. About white working class. I'm not. Well, I'm a, well, guess what? You are absolutely the exception, because what I can tell you is what consistently happens in American white mainstream media when there are conversations about the working class, pretty much black people are being excluded because that phrase alone is being used not to discuss black working class. I mean, the, the examples are, are all over the place. I, I had to have a meeting with Senator Bernie Sanders on this when he kept talking, when he kept speaking against, uh, he kept talking about, um, uh, he was, uh, uh, he kept talking about identity politics. And I was like, Senator, do you know what the hell you're actually saying? What are you labeling identity politics? Well, well, we all Americans. No, no, we're not. Because we're also being treated differently. Because the, the, the phrase identity politics is used the same way wokeness is used against us. Oh, Roland, you're speaking identity politics. No, I'm not. I'm speaking reality. And so this is the struggle that I believe. You know, I believe that, again, there are some great, there are some excellent points that you're making in here. I just think that it's being real that in this country, how certain phrases are used, how certain stories are skewed. It is it is oftentimes it is about how am I appealing to white voters? But I'm used. But we don't even use the phrase president meets with some black preachers. What's going to be the headline? Oh, I see what you're saying. It's going to be president meets with black preachers. But if you meet with white with some, preachers, it'll what's be, be the headline. Preachers. Yeah. President meets with preachers. Um, I, I, let me, let me just, I, I, Pre hold up, hold up, hold up. Yeah. President meets with a group of black CEOs, but if he met with the CEOs of Walmart, of uh, Apple, and let's say these other CEOs, they all white, what's going to be the headline? Right. No, that's, that's, yeah, of course. No, 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 my next question for you. Why the two different headlines? Why? But, uh, but to me, like, to me, the obsession with the in-between erases the total abandonment of the black working class specifically like that i that's my whole thing is that black americans descended from slaves have been abandoned by both sides on the yes. altar of other stuff other things like immigration and gay rights and like all these and other white, stuff. Up, not, but you but you got to add and white women Sure. Because yeah. again, because you got to remember the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The only reason women were included, inserted in that 
because the Virginia, the races out of Virginia thought by adding women that was going to kill the bill. And it actually didn't. When affirmative action came along, the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action in America have been white women. I totally agree with all of that, but I think where we would disagree is that I think a lot of things that white liberals promote ostensibly on behalf of black people actually hurt black people. That that's the thing like that I'm what? trying to say. Like, like defund the police. But 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 you say, but who did that start with? What do you mean who did that start with? No, where where did the, that phrase, that idea, that concept, who did that start with? Somebody who really does not care about poor black people. That's, that's not sure. true. No, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because you know why? we're now in a murder spike. No, 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 no but you're wrong. More the black you're wrong. babies in Philadelphia died of gunshot wounds in 2021 okay. than died of COVID. Like but the, that's... Reason, but, but the reason you're wrong is because if, if that is your perception of that, that means that you have not actually talked to black people who, who, who were talking about that very issue. I've had conversations with black people black activists about defund the police. Defund the police does not mean get rid of the police. Defund the police actually says what you just talked about. How do we shift resources? How, do, how is it that in most major cities, half of a city's budget goes to its police department? The question is not, okay, well, we shouldn't be dealing with that. What people are actually saying is, how do you reimagine that? How do we deal with a situation where we're sending cops Two situations, and I've done this story way too many times. I had to talk to too many of these mothers and fathers where that person dies when they actually had a mental problem as opposed to sending mental or health professionals. Why do we do that? Why are we using police officers doing parking enforcement as opposed to using people who are police officers? So so the, the, so again, just what you just described there is a perfect example of what has happened in, in white mainstream media. And that is not actually sitting with the people who are talking about that and saying, what do you actually mean by that? What does this look like? What does it mean? Now, is it a phrase that the other side can take, slap on a bumper sticker and use it as, as a negative? Absolutely. But if I talk to the people who are actually saying it, those are not white people. I've heard it from black people. Well, I talk to working class black people and black cops all the time. And what I'm hearing from the cops is that they go into these neighborhoods and ever since the defund the police movement and the new view of the cops as every single one of them being like homicidal and out for black blood, they now see kids running around with guns, waving them. They're not scared of the cops anymore and they're not ashamed of the cops anymore. And we are in a, these cities have become war zones children can't get to school without being shot at they can't play in playgrounds without being shot at and i'm i'm just telling you from what i am hearing on the ground this is very connected to the move to the defund movement no they it's not no, no i'm okay. telling you no, but i'm saying like, this i spent six years in chicago six years do you know what one of the fundamental problems in chicago is tell me one of the fundamental problems in chicago ain't defund the police it's not they don't have enough cops it's literally because the police department in Chicago has been so oppressive against black people. Black people don't trust the cops. So the deal is if you show me a city where you actually have relationships between communities and police. I'm going to show you a difference. Please, please go read the Kansas City newspaper, the Kansas City Star. They did an exhaustive investigation about the rampant racism in their police department. And do you know who was mostly quoted in it? Black cops. And so in, and I just came back from Kansas City and did a town hall with the, with the Kansas City Urban League on this very issue. Black cops talk about it. Go to Philadelphia, go to New York. I'm not going to deny no, that we no, need, ask, we ask, need Okay, no, no, I'm not going to deny that we need police reform. We absolutely need police but reform. The, but, we but, have but a it, huge problem with the cops. That's I'm not going right, to deny that. But, I agree with you about that. But what defund the police did was it slapped people in the face. And yes, what then happened is, people, oh, my God, no, we're taking money from the cops. No, you're not. And so was it difficult to explain? And it was. And so it was used as a negative. But the problem I'm saying is it's not that black folks are saying we don't want police. They don't want to get beat up by cops. They don't want to get shot by cops. 
They don't want to get shaken down by cops. And so it's a di- it's a whole different nuance there. My parents were civic club founders. OK, I re- so they dealt with cops and commanders and the police chief all the time. I can tell you since I was eight, nine and ten, I was sitting there having seen the conversations. So black people are not saying we don't want police. What they're saying is we don't want to get shot. Totally. We don't want to get beaten. I totally agree with that. There's an amazing book called Ghetto Side by Jill Leovi. And she writes about how um, there's there's a sort of double edged sword where on the one hand, um, you know, black communities are over policed on misdemeanors, which reduces in reduces trust with the cops. What then happens is that when there is like a a violent crime, a murder, a robbery, a carjacking, they don't want to they don't want to help the cops. They don't want to participate, cooperate with the cops, give testimony because they don't trust them. And so they can't catch killers. They can't actually solve these crimes. Guess who also does that? Which is why the murder clearance rate when the murder yes. victim is black is so much lower. It's yes. 50% lower than when they're white. I and totally also agree with all of that. Who, who? Guess who does that? Because white conservatives and the ATF. Say, follow me here. Follow me here. When I'm talking about how we view things, we have not had a Senate confirmed ATF director in seven years. Because now these are so called believers in law enforcement. But why is it they don't want to confirm an ATF? Who are the Senator Cory Booker went off of them yesterday on this very issue? What I'm what so what I'm saying is when we even even the conversation you and I are having right now, because of our backgrounds and how we look and how we grew up, we see this whole issue totally different. I can talk to people and I can actually say, oh, I see why people think defund the police is negative. But then when I actually talk to people who are dealing with it, dealing with the realities of policing and I hear how they are explaining, I'm like, hmm, it actually makes sense in terms of how do we shift resources? What I'm still going to argue is that I believe that. And again, yes, you and I agree on a number of things that you lay out. But what we have to be honest with is that even we talk about class, whiteness and blackness cuts across class. You can have somebody who went to a state school versus somebody who went to Harvard who is white. And somebody might you might say, well, there that Harvard person is an ally. Uh, Not necessarily, because I'm telling you right now, some of the some of the most crap that I've taken from white journalists have been, yes, white liberals. But wait, let, me, let me ask you something. What is the defund the police's movement's response to the surging crime? Like, what, what is their response to the, these babies being shot down? Easy, easy. Well, here's what you've had. You've had, first of all, you had an explosion, an explosion in the last 12 years of guns being sold in the country. You had, you've had literally the gun lobby and those simply stating point blank. Obama's going to get your guns exploded. Biden's going to get your guns. You had that driving force. That's one. Two, what you had is you literally had police pissed off. They're being held accountable. I saw in Chicago, in Baltimore, they were so angry at the DAs there dared to hold them accountable. You had deliberate slowdowns in Chicago. I, I mean, I covered this. They were they had an inordinate number of broken body cameras, broken dashboard cameras. Why? But Why? What, 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 it, what would be the difference between defund and a slowdown? Defund would have fewer cops. No, less. you're, that's what, Why? See, again, Don't, so tell me again, why. You're, you're defining when defund, you, when you reallocate defining, resources, you have fewer cops. No, first of all, when you start breaking down, okay. Have you, okay. Have you ever covered, you ever covered city hall? No. Okay. Have you ever count, covered county government? No. Okay. So that means you've never, ha- have you ever actually had to sit there and go through what the police budget is? I've read through a police budget. Yes. Okay. All right. So when you actually go through a police budget, uh-huh. when you look at how the allocation is made, there's a, there's a significant number of things that police do that have nothing to do with fighting crime. Nothing, nothing to do. You mentioned it earlier, all those tickets. We know we know based upon the numbers that every ho- that it was an average of four tickets or warrants per household in Ferguson. We saw the survey, all of those areas around St. Louis in St. Louis yes, County. Yes. Okay. Yes. Where that became an yes. economic driving. Yes. Point. Okay. So yeah, so you had that. 
So you start going. So why all of a sudden have you seen police uh, police chiefs say, stop pulling people over over some bullshit license plate? Stop pulling people over when it comes to uh, a, 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 a tail light. Uh-huh. I've, I've heard chiefs say, focus on crime prevention. So part of the problem is that we have given so much money to police departments and a lot of the money is going to non major criminal activity. So when you start shifting, so in Seattle, when they said, wait a minute, why are we putting the money in the police department for parking enforcement? Get Put that money in a separate department to go hand out tickets. How about we examine how they are using the resources? Mm-hmm. So what, that's what defund the police is actually saying. What they're saying is, San Francisco talked about it. Hey, if you get a call, and on the call, they're stating it's a mental issue. Don't send the cops. Dispatch a mental health professional. Okay. To me, that is called police reform, what you just described. But guess what? You choose to call it police reform. Somebody else calls it defund the police because they're choosing to be provocative. Here's the deal. We can call it whatever we want about you as long as we get to the same place. Amen, and brother. That is but, Amen. But, that, but so again, so that's why I'm not hung up on the phrase because you know why what I'm doing, just like I did that Khalid Muhammad speech, I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm not going, oh my God, defund the police. What are they saying? No, I'm listening to what they're saying. And that to me is the problem. We have too many white journalists who aren't listening. They're bringing preconceived notions or they're bringing a perspective of the police or someone else versus let me listen to what this person is saying. That to me, I think is a problem. So I I just don't see it as wokeness. I think this idea of labeling everything wokeness, which look, you go on Fox News a lot, that, that is by design. It is by design, just like this whole thing with critical race theory, which we all know is bullshit. I would be very happy to go on CNN, but they won't have me. Well, hell, Fox, well guess what? Fox, <laughs> Fox, News won't, Fox News won't call me. Fox News. And guess what? I've had people who Fox News will book people who I put on my show and will not call me. And I have a whole email roster of all of their shows and their producers. My agent has actually emailed uh, Suzanne Scott, the CEO of Fox News, directly and their head of talent. They will never call. You know why? Because the perspective that I'm offering, we're talking about right now, Fox News does not want on their air. They don't. And no, so this is they, they no, have pe- they have people from Black Lives Matter on all the time. No, 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 no. no. See, see. OK, but it's OK. Do you know why they have them on there? You know why they have them on there? They let them you know have why? their say. No, no, they don't. Yes, they do. Fox, no, they don't. When the Fox News was created, Roger Ailes created an institution where he says, first of all, our anchors always win. Two, we are going to place people on to purposely put them in an antagonist uh, position. That's why they don't. I'm trying. Look, I'm, I'm, I I'm watch giving a you, lot of I watch a lot of Fox and, you know, you have like, first of all, they have a lot of black hosts, but also they, they no, let people have their uh, say okay, and then they disagree right. with them yeah, if they I'm, don't I'm agree. Trying, uh, OK, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how that system is set up and I'm telling you exactly. You could talk to I've had the conversations with former black talent and actually black producers at the network. Trust me. Fox News will net that no he, they, this is what they say about me. He's different. He's different. So what we're dealing with right now, I'm telling you, is the, which is the struggle in this country when it when it comes. Okay, but to can music. I just say something? Like I don't I don't sit here and say like um you know CNN won't put me on because I'm Jewish. Like I, they don't want my point of view, but that's not like it's not. It's just, they just don't want it, but that's totally fair. Like, I don't hold that against that's them. Fine, they don't want my point of view. They don't want but, it. But, and I'll go back and I'll say it again. Yeah. I'll go back. Fox News likes certain types of black people. Right. I'm telling you. I mean, and, 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 and you know what? You know who I'm quoting? You know who I'm quoting? People who worked at Fox News who have told me. Who have told me. Right. But and that's what we're dealing with. So, the, so, the, so, the, so this issue in media... This issue that we have in media, again, I'm sorry, I don't believe it's wokeness. I believe what it is, is it is there are people who are in positions of power who see the world in a different way. They want to frame the world in their way. 
in through their lens, through their perspective. They're unwilling to actually bring people to the table who might bring a different perspective. And even when, and, and I'll tell you, one of the issues that we face, even when you talk about some black people at the table, it's a black person who they're comfortable with, who also sees the world similar to them. So they're not going to really try to upset the apple cart. It's a struggle in media. I'm telling you. And well, I've, I I've, am, I've seen I, this in so many ways. I'm so. so grateful to you for letting me come on and debate this with you. It was really, really generous of you to read the book and share your opinions with me about it. I'm very grateful and very honored. Uh, well, you know what? I, I'll say this here. Um, there, there are a few people I think you ought, you ought to talk to. You ought to talk to uh, Tim Wise or Jane Elliott. Uh, but I'm, but, but I, and I tell you, so I mean, so I appreciate, again, writing it. Uh, but what I really hope, I really hope, again, looking at, again, how, how the difference in terms of how a lot of white journalists are viewing these stories compared to a lot of black journalists. And trust me, there's a mega struggle. Look, our NABJ convention is in, uh, in Las Vegas uh, in August. Trust me. You drop on by, I think you're going to hear some hell of a stories for your next book. <laughs> I'll come. I'll come. <laughs> All right. The book is Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining uh, Democracy. Uh, Batra Ungar Sargon, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. We welcome you to the launch of the Mass Poor People's Low Wage Assembly and Mara March on Washington, D.C., June 18, 2022. We are a new, unsettling force, and we are to demonstrate the compelling power that we, poor and low-income people, have to reconstruct society from the bottom up. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. Because we know that there is no scarcity in this land. The only scarcity is the moral will to do what's right. are those with sub-minimum wage jobs who can't afford sky-high rent. People with disabilities are the fastest growing minority group. It's crazy to me that in 2021, it's still legal for workplaces to pay a sub-minimum wage to people with disabilities. There are still so much trial and tribulations that we go through as indigenous people. We can't get a decent wage to sustain ourselves, nor can we get adequate housing. Veterans across this nation say enough is enough. We can't pat essential workers on the back on one day and then cut their health care the next day. Health is a political choice. What more do I need to do to prove that my voice is just as valuable as anyone else's? There are still forces in denial that would try to slow walk our transition to a clean economy and a just future for us all. We have an immoral system run by moral people. But together we walk, and we walk and we fight. It's time for a change. Reconstruyamos esta gran nación. See, we are people of resilience as we fight these interlocking injustices together. When we work together, mobilize together, and rise together, we become a voice for the voiceless, and we become an agent of change in a time where great change is needed. We need the third reconstruction to ensure that deaf people, people with disabilities, and all people can have the right to live and to thrive. We know what they are doing, but the question is, what are we going to do? Reconstruction begins when we change our mentality and say it's time for you to get your foot off of my neck. Oh!